Alright, welcome back. One of the crops I get asked about quite a bit are these yams. These are not sweet potatoes. These are true yams, which is the Dioscoria species. Dioscoria. There's Dioscoria alata, Dioscoria canadensis, Dioscoria patatas. There's all kinds of different Dioscoria, but they are a family that has many edible roots in it. And I have a few different varieties right here because we've been harvesting out of the garden lately. And you can see our 2023 yields are up to 2,297 pounds of food out of our backyard. Now this is a garden we've only had for one year, so this is not reflecting mature trees or anything like that. This is you know, our radishes and broccoli and collards and watermelons and cucumbers and pumpkins and sweet potatoes and all kinds of other things. But we're just getting to the point where the yam vines have died down. This happens every year. The yam vines die down and then you dig the yams beneath. You don't want to dig them earlier than that because they're still forming the roots. But now we've had our first frost, we have another frost coming in and the vines have died back and it's time to start digging yams. So this is a Dioscoria alata yam. This is actually about eight pounds but they can make it up to 30 pounds or so. These right here are also Dioscoria alata. However, these are purple inside. You can actually see the purple where they got damaged a little bit. These are the ube yam, they're often called. And we've been pulling these in. These are not as prolific as the yellowy white wilder form, but they do very well. And these right here are an edible form of Dioscoria bulbifera, which is actually called the edible air potato. These grow on the stems of the plant up in the air, which is why they're so clean and beautiful, unlike my other yams. And they have already been harvested because I didn't want them to get destroyed in the freeze. That's Dioscoria bulbifera, edible bulbils. And these are the bulbils of this plant, the Dioscoria alata which are edible, but they aren't particularly palatable. I find them sort of hard and unpleasant, and I just don't like them. I tried eating them. We just use these for planting materials instead and let them grow into nice, big, huge, tender roots, which are not sweet at all. These are much more like a potato. These yams are a starchy crop, not a sweet crop whatsoever. So I was thinking, since we are going to be digging some today just for fun, um, I thought I would take you along and just show you what that looks like. So let's go into the car. How many people do we have here today? 61. Six? 61. 68. Six people. No, 68. 68. That's a little better. That's a little better. I mean, even six people, if they were really high quality people, would be totally fine. But 68 high quality people. Oh, oh. roughly equivalent to the number of children we have in this household. I'll show you this before we make our way down there. This is the uh, crossed daikons, the crossed red king daikons with multiple Japanese varieties and they are making great big beautiful roots. Very productive and they have a nice texture and they keep their good texture. They don't get real spongy on the inside very quickly, which is nice. I just have to leave it here so I remember to pick it up on the way back into the house. But that's enough greens for us to survive through. This is not, you know, we don't need to eat a ton of greens and that's actually a ton of greens. It's like when I harvested the sweet potatoes and you get all those people going, you know you can eat those greens? Yes, I know I can eat those greens, but nobody needs this many greens. Literally like, thousands and thousands and thousands of leaves. Don't waste them. Look, it's not a waste. I'm gonna feed them to the chickens and feed them to the pigs. Feed them back to the soil. Like, I don't, I don't worry about it. Like, literally have way, way too many to eat. It's impossible. Sweetie, uh, there is a machete with an orange handle in my office. Would you grab that? Yeah. 
is our Connor Crickmore trellis from Never Sink Farms. This is the trellis design he uses, which has done well, though it's starting to get saggy under the weight of all of these yams. You can see the vines have died back. We have some uh, Dioscoria pentaphylla that were down here at the end, and then some Dioscoria alata. And I, I think they're mostly Dioscoria alata. I tried growing Dioscoria rotundata up here, but it didn't it didn't do well. Um, sorry, I can't get too far away from the microphone because you guys won't be able to hear me. Everybody says, I can't hear. Well, it's just an iPhone with a cracked lens. And it, it we don't put a mic on it or anything. You just have to suffer through it, I guess. So I'm sorry, but I'll try to stay closer to the camera. So anyhow, it's getting saggy. So I think we should have used larger conduit or put less yams on it, which would be the easiest thing to do. We also had a windstorm that pushed it partway sideways, but it mostly stayed together. Down at the base here, it actually gets hard to figure out where the yams are because they've dried out so much that they'll just crack and move away from the yams beneath. Unlike sweet potatoes, the true yams are climbers. And you can force sweet potatoes to climb, but they often just run along the ground and root. If you do that with these yams, they don't root and they are very unhappy. They don't like that at all. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig these guys bit by bit. I don't have to dig them. I could leave them all in until spring but then I don't get to write the big numbers on my board. And you can just leave them in the ground until April, it's totally fine. I, I, don't, I don't even know why I feel compelled to dig them, except that I know they're ready and I, I could dig them. So I, so I do. We have any questions? Anybody's got any questions? Um, so here, you can see we already dug some. These are the pockets. We had a yam about every three feet through here, and we had a yam every three feet on the other side. So uh, that was actually a lot of weight. And this area collapsed, unfortunately. I'll show you here, you can see how they they grow the bulbils on the vine, like this. These are actually just growing, hanging in the air. These here we can plant and grow more yams with this next season. This is Dioscoria alata that makes this type there are varieties in Florida that are poisonous and invasive, and so you have to be careful. There's, there are varieties of Dioscoria bulbifera that are wilder, and they have a lot of Dioscenin in them, which is a toxin. It will make you throw up, it messes with your hormones, and it can make your hair fall out, which you obviously don't want. I mean. I don't want to judge, but I think most people wouldn't want that. So this section here is the first area I've got to clear off. If anybody is looking for these yams, there are some weird regulations from state to state on what you're supposed to ship and sell and all that kind of stuff. And we don't really want to get in trouble. However, this weekend, I will be selling the roots. I am going to do a sale at the flea market Flea Market is in the nearby town of Atmore, Alabama, and I will bring roots, and I will put them up for sale, and they will be for pet consumption only. <laughs> That's what they do with raw milk. So my wife said, just like raw milk. So anyhow, we will be selling the roots, which you could eat, and if you planted them, that's not my fault. But they will be, they are, they are edible roots and we will be selling roots for culinary purposes only. So if you've been looking to get these, there's only a time of year that you can get them is, is, is now, basically. So if you are going to uh, 
If you want to get them, come over and see us. I will put some up. We have a limited amount because we use them ourselves to feed ourselves, to feed animals. And we just, we're, we're collecting and breeding up enough so we have a ton for the homestead. I like to make sure that friends have them and that we have tons of them because it is really the best survival root crop for this area, possibly tied with sweet potatoes, but I prefer these as a survival root crop to sweet potatoes, even though I grow lots of sweet potatoes, because being them being starchy instead of being sweet, I find them to be more versatile. I don't want to eat sweet stuff all the time, and we can basically make mashed potatoes out of these, and we can fry them, and that kind of thing. It's not... It's not limited to dishes, you know, with marshmallows in them. I'm just kidding. We don't put marshmallows in our sweet potatoes. That's, that's, we just don't do that. However, if I'm at your house and you put marshmallows in there, I might, I might ignore my principles and eat them. It's not that it doesn't taste good. It's just my wife won't let me have them. Because it's not classy or something. So somewhere in here, I know that there is another yam that is probably broken off at the ground because we are three feet from the previous one. There we go. There's one right there. That is the base of one that still has a little bit of green on it, which is kind of getting uncommon for this time of year. What I often do, depending on how big they are, is uh, because we have sandy soil, I take a garden hose and stick it down in there and just blast water around the root. You want to help dig? This one doesn't look like a very big one. This was probably an itty bitty one, and it's probably a purple one. It is. So this one is so small that it's gonna go in the, the replanting. The great thing about it is you can just replant the entire root. Next year, it will just make a bigger root. It'll eat this root and it'll grow a new root. So if I just take this guy and replant it, it will grow next year into a big root like this. I don't have to eat this yet. Alternately, we could just cut the top of it off and replant the top and eat the bottom part of it. But I'm just gonna plant the whole thing so it has more vigor. We are pretty close to the, the right growing zone for these guys, but they really are truly a tropical. The thing that saves us is that they survive through the winter because it coincides with the dry season where they would normally go. So they, they have a normal dormancy cycle, a dry season, wet season dormancy cycle. And so that allows us to grow them and then when they freeze down, it's pretty close to the time they would have gone to sleep anyway. So they've already made good sized roots. And I would say that they're uh, growable from zone eight right through the tropics. That isn't to say you can't grow yams at all if you live further north because there is the Chinese yam, the Escoria polystachia, the Chinese yam which is also called the yam berry because it makes little edible air potatoes all over the vines that are like little berries. You can eat them raw or cooked. They taste like little potatoes. Those yam berries will grow all the way up into zone five. So it's not a strictly tropical family. There are varieties that go further. Right, I'm gonna figure out where our next one is. Okay, so we dug one there already. out where the next one is. Yep, there's a bull bill. Where did that one come from? Somewhere in here. <laughs> Somewhere in here. It's gotta be in here somewhere. It must exist. There we go. There's the next one. Now, like I said, the purple ones are way less vigorous 
than the white ones. I've not been particularly impressed with them. However, the color is awesome. Do the yamberries make tubers? The yamberries will also make tubers, yes. If you plant them, they will grow into full-size tubers and they can get very long, about that big around, the ones we've grown. I grew them in a pot once and they basically turned into giant python-like snakes in the bottom of the pot. They curled up in the bottom of the pot in a coil, which was really cool. This is a purple one, but it's actually a pretty good size, seems like. You have to be careful not to break them when you lift them. This is a two-parter. That's a good size. Yeah, that's a good size. You see how exceptionally it's purple and white. Very pretty. The part's white and it's got the purple around it. They're often different streaks of white and purple inside. Here, watch your fingers. Cut this. These guys I'll probably replant too. Or I will take them to the I'll take them to the flea market with me and give somebody else a chance to uh, plant them. We finally are at a point where I feel like we have enough surplus that we can share a little more instead of just seeds. Instead of just growing them for our own seeds. A lot of times I'll show stuff on YouTube and I'll say, you know, this, we're trying this or we're trying this. And can you sell me some? No, I can't. Because I don't hardly have enough for us. Or like, like in the case of those, uh, some of those uh, edible bulbifera that I have, I paid twenty dollars for two little, two little aerial tubers, which I well, I planted and spent three years growing up enough stocks. So now we've got about a five-gallon bucket full of them. Now I have enough seed to share, but. Oh, I didn't back then. And that's the non-invasive form, incidentally. There is an invasive Euscoria bulbifera. It's kind of like, you gotta be careful because there's, there's species and there's cultivars. Like you can have a wild tail or something, or you can have a, uh, a really amazing cabbage and they, the cabbage will never reproduce itself, but that wild kale might reproduce itself almost infinitely and make tons and tons of seeds. There you go, here's another one. This one. one. Oh, good job. That's another aerial one. What happens if you were to break them when you were pulling it out? Oh, they just don't keep as long. They generally tend to heal over, but I try to pull the whole thing up entire. It's more, it's more of a, uh, it's more just a pride thing. I want to see the entire root intact and have it look really cool so you could see the whole thing. I, I like to pretend I'm a paleontologist digging up rare fossils. And if I get one and I break it, I feel like I failed the game. Yesterday we dug a cassava. I should probably show you the cassava too. I'll bring some cassava cuttings as well to the to the market. Ooh, this is a big one. We might need the hose for this one. You want to get the hose? I will show you the Florida hose <clears throat> technique. Even if it's 
Do the vines make better biochar or do they like do they become a big tangled mess in the compost pile? Like what's, what's It's interesting. Best? When they're when they're growing like this, I've used them to feed to the goats and to the cows who seem to relish them. But when they dry up later in the year, it's really efficient. Can you tell me what they're it off? Go for it. It's really efficient at sucking everything out of it. They actually break down really easily. They just crumble away. And if, I, if you leave them out through the course of the winter, they will really just crumble up and turn into nothing. Um, so they're, they're fine in the compost pile. Just stomp them down. Okay, so yeah, this is a bigger one, I think. This is a Florida technique. I don't know. You know, if some of you guys living in more northerly climates or in clay soils have ever done this, but in Florida, you can stick a hose down into the ground for ever and the hose will get stuck. I did this, we did this regularly when we were kids and we ruined a few hoses. We got in trouble, we were told to never do it again. But, uh, the, the hose will actually push the sand out of the way and you can just use it like a little blaster to blast blast your way through the problem is is that because the hose will just continue to do this I could just keep feeding the hose deeper and deeper into the ground this is just something about sandy soils and hoses that you may not have known on the other hand it makes a really good way I can feel the edge of the yam and then blast the water to free the base of it up and it has it's actually quite a bit of yam in there you can see it looks like I lost a piece of it possibly I lost a piece There's more in there. And there goes my flannel shirt. Alright, so that's like half of it. You gonna dig for it? <laughs> Should have rolled my sleeves up before I played in the mud. in there. Oh, it's big too. It's crazy. Tyrannosaurus. Discorio Rex. Oh, we're killing. Yep. It's in there. But it, it goes really deep. Yeah, do you need a shovel? Just blast the hose around the edge of it. Oh no, it's going sideways too. It's a beast. We only divide it off half. Oh, another part of it just broke. Somebody says Bethemus is in there. Yeah, well, my wedding ring is in there somewhere too. Oh, no. <laughs> Found by a hobbit 500 years from now. Well, it gets way down in there. It is, it's in there somewhere. This will be fun. <laughs> It's okay, folks. It's like his fifth one because he does this all the time. <laughs> it's a replacement of a replacement of a replacement. Yeah. Did you find my wedding ring? <laughs> it's a 
This is ridiculous. It's way in there. Here it goes. This is like, this is quality content, right guys? <laughs> what am I watching? Why do you watch this guy? What is he even doing and why are we watching it? Are you sure there's more yam in there? There is, it's gigantic. No, I've got my hands on it. <laughs> but I can't get it out without breaking it. It is massive. Well, and how, then I gotta go get the metal detector. Yeah. How big do you think <laughs> how big do you think it is? Uh I don't know, it's probably five pounds or more. Maybe eight eight or more. Here it goes. There we go. That's a lot of yam. It was in clay. So Okay, here you can sorry, you can turn this off. Got it. <laughs> Digging for gold. Losing your ring. So someone said that <clears throat> the yam doesn't look very tasty for all that work. <laughs> uh, it tastes like potatoes. It tastes like potatoes. But you see how much we actually got here. This is enough to feed a good meal to four people right there. It's, uh, it's a humble but easily grown source of calories. Comfort food. When you're sad that you lost your wedding ring, somewhere down in this hole, it's probably here. I have to get the metal detector out and go hunting for it. I might have lost it in the previous hole, who knows? But the metal detector can see where I can. I just figure if I pull the mud out, maybe it'll show up. I could blast it down into the center of the earth with the hose, Florida style. I, I mean, I like this kind of work. It's like very, very satisfying. Don't you guys want to grow this crop? <laughs> eat, your, eat your wedding ring. Okay, here we go. There it goes, off to the races. Sometimes they just go straight down and they're easy to get. Some of them don't have, they have a big flat shape. It kind of depends on what they run into. We've had them get around the tree roots too because you can just plant them next to a tree. Look at that. That's a lot of that's a lot of calories right there too. It's a nice big one. It's broke off. 
So right there, that's probably, you know, eight pounds. But eight pounds of root. Beautiful. So, that's enough on yams for right now. Incidentally, well, I'm gonna say enough on yams, but I'm gonna show you this first. This piece right here that's growing off the side is the yam that I planted. That's the piece I planted last year, which then was digested by the plant. That's all old flesh, gross, unusable, spongy, inedible. That was mostly used to go through right here. So it built this entire yam off of this old piece. So that was digested for the most part. Sometimes they just dry up and they turn brown. They become completely just nothing. Here you can see, this was the piece I planted last year, which was digested and it grew this. This piece here was digested and it grew this. So if you start with a large chunk like this and you plant it, it'll digest this. And next year it'll make a yam about that big. That's pretty epic very hard to beat that. I'm gonna put my machete right here so I remember to come back and take my metal detector to this spot and see if I could find my fifth or sixth wedding ring. Oh well. I'm gonna show you something else before I close this stream out. I wanted you to see over here we were running the duck around through our cassava patch. First we started with tomatoes and I planted chunks of cassava cane in between the tomatoes. There's the old tomato vine. And then we planted pieces of cassava in between. And they grew tall. And here we cut them down. There's probably a good sized bit of roots in there, but then Three of my sons and I came out here and we covered them all up with this rotten hay. Cows know I have it. Cows love to eat anything we throw over the fence. So this area here we covered up to make sure the uh, stumps of these things don't freeze. And some of our cassavas did really, really well this year and some of them did so-so but because it was a very hot and dry summer. If it's hot, it's not a big deal. If it's hot and wet, they love it. Hot and dry, not so hot. That's not good. This one right here, this is what they're supposed to look like. I didn't take this one down, so I had an example here. This one is very happy. It's in a good spot. It's probably got some good root development down here and very, very thick stems. But this is all gonna freeze down to the ground. And since these were a little smaller, we didn't want to harvest them. They were all about that big. We took them down, covered over them. And then in the spring, in about late March, early April, when the ground is warm and the sun is warm and it's not gonna freeze ever again for the year, we'll uncover them and let them grow out of there. We found that that works better than just letting them freeze all the way to the ground. Plus, if you follow me to the greenhouse, I can show you what we do with all the cane. Here, various types of cassava. We probably have five or six different types, all of which the names are lost on. We don't know what their names are, but uh, we we save a wide variety of genetics that way. You know, some are going to be resistant to some things, and some are going to do better than others, and some are faster and some are slower. But they're all good cassava, good good named sweet varieties of cassava. So these canes here, we cut up and we will save through the winter. People have asked, you know, how do you keep them through the winter? Uh, we've tried a lot of different methods. One year we buried a trash can in a sand pile, 
and the water got into it and they all rotted in there and died, which is very unfortunate because when I dug it up to see what it looked like, they had roots and shoots that had obviously grown and it had been alive until moderately recently when uh, apparently they just flooded too much and it was too cold and they rotted in there. They can't be too wet over the winter or they rot. When it's cold and wet, they're tropicals. They can't grow at all, they can't heal, they can't recover, so they die. If they are too dry, they dry out and they die. They have to be very slightly moist, like moderate humidity levels, but not enough to allow them to rot. And it has to be warm enough so they can heal themselves, but not so warm that they just start growing again wherever you put them because then they're more susceptible to dying before you get them in the ground in the spring. So I often take them and I put them in a big tote, like one of those big plastic bins that they sell at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever. And I cut cuttings about that long, lay them in it with a little bit of hay down in the bottom, lay it in there and lay another layer of hay over it and put the lid on. Now we're talking not wet, but it's just very slightly moist because of the hay. And uh, I have sprinkled a little water in there and covered them too. That usually works. I also had a friend who took them just like this and he put, a, he put them in a big plastic trash bag and he tied it shut and he put it in his garage and it didn't freeze in his garage. And when he opened it up in the spring, they had little yellow shoots all over them and they were ready to be planted. So I keep my big bin on the porch, but last year it got so cold that the porch froze too, even through the windows that were there and it killed about three quarters of those. I've also planted them directly in the ground and had them shoot up again in the spring, rather like you do with sugar cane. But the cassava that you do that with uh, sometimes I've, I've had it get killed over the winter because here it's been really wet during the winter and it's wet and cold so they rot in the ground which is not good so I keep some boxes I keep some stumps in the ground uh, we will take a lot of these and sell them my daughter sells the cane cuttings in her store uh, on Etsy good gardens on Etsy and she's got some of these cane cuttings for sale so we sell some of them and then we plant some of them. I'll take you down to see that. And you can see we have different pots of various things. A lot of these are tropicals that we don't want to get killed through the winter. These we just planted a couple of days ago. These are all Cassavas right here, these are papaya, so it's just to be confusing. But these are different varieties of cassava down here. And then, here's one that we started more like uh, a month, a month ago. So we could take this, keep it alive through the winter and then in the spring, it will very happily go in the ground. This one is kind of funny because it was growing next to some tobacco and because it gets watered every day, some of the tobacco seeds fell in it. And so it has a tobacco and a cassava together, which you, you just rarely see that. You can get your carbs and your nicotine and uh, I'll just let doctors decide which one's worse for you. So that's how we do it. We, that's one way, you know, the burying thing really does work well, or it did work well in North Florida. We just, put a bunch of them in a pit and put a piece of plywood over the top of the pit and opened it up in the spring and they were fine. And you could probably do that if you dug a hole and it didn't flood and you just put a, throw a little bit of hay or something over it just to keep a little insulation in there, put a tarp or something over the top of it because you don't want water to go into that pit. If it's wet and cold, it'll rot and die and that's it. So cassava we're really pushing the zone on that's really tropical i find that the the yams are more productive here than they are but uh i like cassava and it has almost no pest issues so with a little bit of extra effort to grow it i i think it's worth it uh if we were clever enough about it and we could find faster growing varieties i think it could easily replace the potato here as a staple and then we'll have you know, redundancy. We've got our yams, we've got our sweet potatoes, we've got potatoes, and we have cassava. So as many different varieties and different varieties of yams and different varieties of potatoes.
different varieties of sweet potatoes, different varieties of cassava. You you have a lot more uh, diversity in case you get a bad year or bad season. Do you have a question? <clears throat> no? My wife is making weird faces. I don't know what you guys are doing in the chat. But, yeah, that's what we got so far. So I wanted you to see the yams, and uh, if you want to come out and, and get some yams, I will bring them to the Atmore Flea Market in Lower Alabama on Saturday. We'll be there from, let's say, 8 a.m. to probably noon, maybe 1, depending on how busy it is. 8 a.m. to 1 is what we usually do. And I'll bring some plants. This is not the best time of year for gardening, obviously, but it is the time of year that we have yams and cassava, which are very hard to get the rest of the year. So if you're interested in that, I'll have that. And I'll have some sugar cane too. So maybe you'll come out and see us. Thanks for joining us. I uh, hope you enjoyed this little live stream. I've got to go look for my wedding ring now, but it was all worth it for you guys to see us digging yams live. Have a great rest of the week. I'll catch up with you all soon. Be sure to check out thesurvivalgardener.com where I post on gardening daily. And until next time, may your thumbs always be green. <laughs>